For me, I love wine and I drink wine. It makes me happy and wine for me, it's sharing love with other people for any reason and takes you to somewhere. The journey, it's really beautiful. Today on Dirty Linen, we are having a very special and important conversation with Fahad Bandesh. Fahad is a human rights activist. He's a guitar maker, a musician, an artist. He's also a wine and spirit maker. He came to Australia as a refugee after leaving Iran. Fahad, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to have you on the show. And um, just at the start of the conversation, I'd like to acknowledge Anna Bailey, who alerted me to your story, first of all. She's a previous guest on the podcast and a great young journalist. Uh, But tell us, Fahad, about Bandesh Wine and Spirits, which is soon to launch. Bandesh Wine and Spirits, it's uh, inspiration by me. Uh, This uh, brand, it's new, kind of a... in uh, influence of Kurdish technique in this, which is really great. And it's a new brand who this brand going to make uh, the first Arak in Australia. And actually it's Kurdish Arak uh, and Kurdish gin as well. And produce some red wine as well. Wow. That's really amazing because I think often... You know, if we hear Kurdish Arak or Kurdish gin, even Kurdish wine, people would be quite surprised because we don't necessarily think of a wine culture in Kurdistan or in in Iran, the Kurdish part of Iran. Like, tell us about, you know, give us a bit of a sense of the history of wine in that part of the world. In Kurdistan, uh, in Iran side, it's not allowed to make wine, which is really sad. The Kurdish people, they are... Uh, making wine for thousand and thousand years, uh, but this kind of culture gonna be in secret way to make wine. It's really sad. Uh, we make wine in really um, Asian way, which is traditional way, and we make wine for friends and family, and we. With love, we make this beautiful drink and share it with other people. And so would you have to bake it and drink it in secret? In Iran side, you can make it in secret and drink it in secret, which is really sad. But in other part of Great Kurdistan, it's fine. They can drink public. Yeah, so on the Iranian side, when the Islamic regime came to power in 1979, uh, alcohol was banned, so drinking wasn't allowed, and I suppose this whole part of Kurdish culture had to go underground. Is that is that what happened? Yes, they they tried to break everything down, and um, the people forget about their culture, and they cannot practice this beautiful. Um, Mm, yeah, kind of uh, culture and still people making wine but very small it's not winery there but in they make it in home yeah okay and what is it that you love about this about wine making about the culture around it uh, Kurdish people they have a really uh, very history very really great history about making wine and I believe the the Kurdish people they are the first people who make beer and wine in the world but at the moment there is no any brand in Kurdistan and for me I love wine and I drink wine it makes me happy and wine for me it's sharing love with other people for any reason and takes you to somewhere the journey it's really beautiful i think and when you have a glass of wine you forget about your pain and you just enjoy the time dance listen to music and share the story and 
it's really poetic in Kurdistan. Most of the poets in Kurdistan, they drink wine and then start writing, which is really beautiful. Wow, that is really amazing. <laughs> I'm so, yeah, I'm so, I'm shook by that. That's really, what a beautiful way to, th- to think about wine. I just, yeah, that's really exciting. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to your enjoyment of wine, but you have had a very difficult uh, journey to come to Australia where you are also part of a, a winemaking company now. But tell us about leaving Iran, the, the circumstances in which you left and, and your um, journey to Australia. Uh, I left my land 2000 to in, uh, 2013. Uh, I wasn't safe there because of my activities which is uh, music Kurdish music and talk about Kurdish culture and the history in Iran is not allowed even talk about your people your history your culture your dance your music everything is banned there I decided to find a safe place I came to Australia 2013 and I was in detention for nearly eight years. Um, so you came through Indonesia, did you? And then got and then by boat t- towards Australia. Yeah, I got uh, Indonesia. Um, I was there for three months. I had a really terrible times there, and finally I got a boat uh, from Jakarta to Christmas Island. I was in Christmas Island about two weeks. The Australian government exiled me with other innocent refugees to Manus and others to Nauru. I was on Manus Island for six years. I have been through with loss of pain, trauma, and the government insult me and others. They stolen my belongings and they just said you need to go back to your land there is no room for you was that a ever a consideration for you i mean uh, you left iran because you weren't safe could you ever have considered returning no i cannot go back it's zero so this awful six years that you were there on on manas fahad how did that come to an end and where did you go next on Manas Island, uh, uh, you know, they made us sick mentally and physically. They designed this actually deliberately to make people sick, and and then we won in legislation. Where the bill was for those people are sick, they can come to Australia for treatment. The Medivac bill. Uh, start that to take the innocent Sikh refugees to bring them to Australia to treat uh, treat them. Uh, 2019, they transferred me from Manus to Melbourne to get uh, medical treatment. But instead of medical treatment, they locked me up with other refugees in hotel rooms. There wasn't fresh air, no sunshine. Even you cannot talk about your human, basic human rights. They punished me. They exiled me again from Mantra Hotel to Maita. They took my art materials and my guitar. I cannot practice anything. And is this system is really cruel. So Maita is a... Yeah, yeah, like a refugee centre. You move from hotel detention to a um, refugee detention, I guess a specially built place. But, I mean, what sounds very clear, Fahad, is that you were evacuated to Australia from Manus for medical treatment, which, you know, doctors had decided you were you needed, uh, but you weren't given the treatment that you needed when you got here. Instead, you were punished further. Is that is that is that a fair summary? That's right. And, I mean, a lot of refugees in your circumstance would have felt 
silenced by this treatment. They, you know, understandably were were fearful of speaking out. But you you spoke out a lot, didn't you? Like you were really you were quite an activist while you were in detention. Yes, I couldn't to be silent. I wrote uh, many p- political songs and many artwork. I, I have done more than 100 artwork while I was in the town. What, ma- what made you so brave? Uh, I think I cannot uh, be silent when there is something against human beings, against human rights. I cannot be silent. I need to fight fight for human rights and those things the refugees suffering it's really basic human rights the australian government denied this and they they just blaming each other this party the other parties they make this uh, law they say no they you made this law we need to think about it we are human and we ask for help not punishment they cannot play with human beings. It's um, to be a person that is used as a deterrent, as refugees have been used by um, the Australian government, it must be just the most sickening, desperate feeling. Yeah, it is. So far, had. It's it's just I'm you know I I I want to apologize I want to make it all better I wish it was not like this um, it's really devastating to um, it's Australia's shame that that you have been treated like this and so many other refugees. However, you you are now out of detention. Can you tell us about that part of your story? I am free. But I am not free. Why I am not free? Because of uh, the pain, the trauma still with me. And part of the the things is about um, temporary visa. I am still struggling for permanent. And this is another battle we need to fight for. There are more than 33,000 innocent refugees who living in Australia in temporary visa. Yeah, so these temporary visas, as, I mean, the, the name explains it. They don't give you permanency in Australia. They don't give you all the same rights as somebody who is living here as, as an Australian. What are some of the things that you're not able to do on this uh, temporary bridging visa, Fahad? There are lots of restrictions on this visa. I cannot study. I cannot get any qualification. Where we can find a person cannot study is ridiculous. They banded us. We cannot study. We cannot get qualification. We cannot make our business. We cannot be safe here. And this is... Uh, this this is a really cruel policy to make people down and down. We are less than others. We are people. We are all the same. We need to have the same right. How did you come to start making wine in Australia? I am working at the winery. Uh, I started in Mac Forbes in Yarra Valley. He's a great guy. He helped me a lot, and I learned there. Uh, and I am right now. I am working with Bandish Wine and Spirits. Bandish Wine and Spirit uh, created by General Quincy, and I think she's amazing at this business. So one of the other things that you're not able to do is actually have a liquor license, right, or have the licenses that you need to um, to be able to make the wine in your own name. If I want to make a wine on my name, I first I need to get liquor license. So my visa says I cannot even think about it. I cannot apply for this option. So 
for me, I cannot even think about it. One day I can make one because I am still on temporary visa. Yeah. So Janelle Quincy, who is, um, the, I guess, the person whose who's name Bandesh Wine and Spirits comes under. So you're working with her um, to create some of these drinks. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Amazing. So um, tell us about Kurdish Arak. Kurdish Arak, it's a, a great flavor with star anise, cinnamon and phenol. I think it's really a smooth and nice. It's similar to other Middle East Arak, but it's a little bit different at the same time. I think it's really a smooth. Everyone, I think, will love it if they drink it. And t- tell us about the Kurdish gin. The Kurdish gin, it's very unique. We found some uh, plant in my homeland, and uh, this is the first Kurdish gin in the world. And I think there is some spice there, which is uh, unique because of the land. In Kurdistan, we only can find those plants in my land. It's so um, it's so interesting. You know, you're here. You're not really free, as you've explained. But in Kurdistan or in Iran, you couldn't make make <laughs> drinks, make alcoholic drinks freely. It's um, it just str- strikes me uh, that you've had all these um, restrictions on on your life and your work from you know for so long now. Yeah, it is. In Iran, I cannot make drink, and here also I cannot. Hopefully, in future, very soon, the law change for refugees and refugees can be safe here. Yeah, well, I really hope so, and I encourage anybody who's voting in the election that's coming up in May to look at the refugee policies of um, the various candidates and yeah, to vote for refugees because refugees are not able to vote here for for themselves. Um, Australia that considers itself a country of welcome and justice uh, certainly has a lot of work to do to um, to welcome people who've left their homelands for for good reasons. I think it's so it's so difficult for for people to understand. You know, people that have grown up in the freedom of Australia to understand that just for, for dancing or singing or expressing your history and culture, that that would put you in such danger that you uh, went through such awful times but could not consider returning. I mean, it really should, it really explains that it's, you're not just, you're not just coming on a, coming on a boat and a perilous journey for fun. It's like, this is mortal danger. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, what's what's your impressions of the wine industry here in Australia? I mean, it must be it must be so different to the um, what you saw back home. Yeah, here is uh, different uh, because of the winery and facilities and the land. It's really beautiful. Can you taste? You know, you said you know Kurdish wine. You really can taste. That culture, that heritage. Can you also? What can you taste in Australian wine? Like, what does it say to you? Oh, here is a little bit different, but uh, they always they have some similarity. The wine, uh, I think, Kurdish wine is very similar to Italy. The traditional way they make it, it's very similar. Okay, and then I guess Australia we do have lots of Italian varietals, but. Um, yeah, lots of different climates here as well. What's what's the tell us about Kurdish food? Like, what's what sort of food would you eat with uh, with with the wine, or or just in general? Tell us about some of the food that you grew up with. Uh, for me, if someone wants to ask me honestly, I leave the option for people to choose because some of the people. Most of the people these days, they vegan. They don't drink uh, wine with meat. But for me personally, I I think uh, I like kebab. Uh, it's very traditional, lamb kebab, 
with red wine, which is great. And this red one, I prefer to be Shiraz. And if you know, Shiraz is a city in Iran and the grape, this variety come from this land. Ah, oh, wow. It's so, so resonant. Um, what about Arak? Like what are the, some good snacks to have with Arak? Arak, uh, you can choose some spice uh, or chips, whatever, some uh, dip and also uh, some goat cheese, I think. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I choose. I don't know. It's up, up. Yeah, everyone has a different flavor, different taste. Yeah, but actually I could imagine maybe like some goat cheese, uh, but with herbs as well, because I know in, in Iranian food there's so many, so much use of herbs. Yes, that's right. Mm. Ooh, yeah, sounds so good. Um, Fahad, it's, um, you know, the visa that you're on now, it's when, when is the, you know, what's the, is there an end date on it? What, hap- what do you think will happen next? The visa, um, I have uh, is six months visa, and after six months, gonna expire, and I need to apply for new. So in June, my bridging visa gonna be expire, and I don't know what's gonna happen. They are gonna give me the same visa or nothing or they're going to change it. What's your best hope? What would you, what, if you could just dream the right solution for yourself, what would you, what would you dream up? Uh, the dream, I think, is for everyone in Australia. Uh, we, need a, we need a better government to build a new policy and this policy should be under human rights and everyone here who live in Australia, they are safe, included indigenous people, refugees and other people. Fahad, I think, you know, your generosity in extending your hopes to other people who are marginalised and vulnerable and in danger is really speaks, says so much about who you are. I think Australia is so lucky that you're here sharing your gifts with us. Uh, I really hope that your dreams come true. Thank you. We hope so. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.